to be back in Buckingham. It's been a couple of years, I think, prior to COVID. I was in short pants in the 70s, um, so I don't remember uh, what it was like, but I was told it was grim. Um, it was grim, I think, for many people because it was a whole world of uncertainty. The Bretton Woods regime, if you recall, had broken down in the late 60s into the 70s. The pound floated in June 72, the dollar floated a year later. And for policymakers, it was a very different experience how to actually make international monetary rules when there were no rules under the Thursday exchange rate. And, of course, coupled to this, you have payments problems, world payment problems, increased global capital mobility. You have the oil shock of 1973-74, that first one, known as OPEC-1. Um, that, they all combined, really, to inflict these nominal and then real shocks onto the uh, international economy. And, effectively, the UK, of course, was one of the worst... Uh, performance in this period. It's just a, a very simple chart just showing inflation, unemployment, productivity growth, which has been a long bugbear, of course, in the UK. Highlighted in bold there, highlighted in bold there, we've got the inflation performance, 13.1, as opposed to Germany, 5.1. Unemployment in the 70s, 4.4%. Productivity growth, 1.2. Only slightly above the USA, 0.4. Um, the inflation thing is the area I want to focus on clearly, uh, and effectively, if you look at the consumer price inflation, I know often RPI is, is used for this period, but to get standardised OECD statistics at CPI, there is the UK in the dark line. You can see a peak there in the mid-70s, um, as opposed to the G7, which is the dashed line. So the UK had an inflation problem, amongst many things. If you stand back from the perspective at the end of Bretton Woods 50 years ago and the move to floating, I think there are three regimes that we can generally describe to control inflation over this period of time. Monetary targets, which were adopted by a wide number of countries during the 1970s, but by the end of the 1980s, almost all of those countries had abandoned monetary targets. There was a move towards exchange rate targets, first of all in, in Europe uh, with the SNAKE um, in the early 1970s and then with the ERM. And then, of course, it became a Deutschmark zone in the 1980s. And then when everyone got fed up with these, they went to inflation targets. We've already heard about inflation targets earlier. And the four guidance, which I still struggle to understand, I'm, I'm actually wrapped up in the inflation targets. The point is, there's been a clear shift away from non-monetary explanations of inflation to explanations where money matters. Now, we've already heard this morning, for some people, money matters more than to others. But for the bulk of the post-1945 British experience, money did not seem to matter much at all. And of course that changed, as many people would argue, and have argued, when uh, Margaret Thatcher came to power in 1979. Now there have been occasions, there were occasions prior to that when money seemed to matter a little more, after the 60-70 valuation of sterling when the IMF came in, the 76 sterling crisis, of course, when money supply targets were introduced to placate financial markets. But underlying it all, there was still a view that inflation was caused by things other than the growth of the money supply. So there has been this clear shift away. Whether or not we are happy that we're no longer operating broad money supply targets or the exchange rate targets caused the UK problems when we were trying to stay in the ERM for those two years between 1990 and 1992. And, you know, arguably now when we have these inflation targets and we have a regime effectively which seems more rigid in some ways, MPC meetings once every two months in the 70s and 80s, you have to have regular meetings between the bank, the Chancellor and the Prime Minister. I suppose the debates that we've sort of touched on this morning as well, better from Tim and Juan, about how money matters, the, the debates between the Keynesians and the monetarists, which were very intense in the 60s, and particularly the 70s, they began to fade away in the 1980s. The links between the money supply and prices, to be honest, are not well articulated today by central bankers. We've heard examples already of that. And that's really unfortunate, because at its heart, understanding inflation can simply be gleaned, can't it, from simply applying the laws of supply and demand to money itself. It's that simple. As Milton Friedman said, we heard inflation is always there and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. But the second half of that sentence is rarely ever quoted. It continues in the sense that it is and can be produced only by a more rapid increase in the quantity of money than in output. However, 
There are many different possible reasons for monetary growth, including gold discoveries, financing government spending, and financing of private, spe of private spending. The focus of this paper is on the non-monetary and monetary explanations of inflation in the 70s. I'll first look at how economic historians have favoured non-monetary explanations to account for the rise in inflation. A few words to say on that because it's very simple. Um, I'll turn to the arguments made by the monetarists in the 70s, just to remind us of what they were saying then. And recent work by Ed Nelson and his co-authors, and Forrest Cappy with his history of the Bank of England. The monetary policy neglect thesis, which comes from Ed Nelson's work, has been challenged by Duncan Eden from the 1970s. Um, and to do this, Duncan has had to go into the archives of the bank and the treasury and has used certain documents. But when I look at these documents and the Treasury archives and other sources, this paper contends that the monetary policy neglect thesis does hold for the 1970s. It's as simple as that. They neglected the role of the money supply. So what are the views of inflation in the 1970s? Tim's already talked about Samuelson. There are other economic textbooks out, out there like Blanchard and a whole range of them that effectively do a disservice to the role of money. If you are an economic historian studying in British universities and you pick up a core textbook by Alec Kencross, Sidney Pollard, Alan Booth or Jim Tomlinson, inflation is a non-monetary phenomenon. It's not considered at all. The only economic historian I can find that actually is interested in talking about money at all is Roger Middleton, who in one of his books talks about the barber boom of the early 1970s. And when he talks about that, I'll read the exact quote, most economists would be comfortable with the proposition that the Heath government should not have allowed the loose monetary policy of 71-73 that preceded the very high inflation rate that we now associate with the 70s. Mm. That's the only example I can find in the literature. If I go to Boone's book, for example, you don't even get inflation in the index. You know, this is madness. The alternative, there is one alternative out there, um, Shorts and Woodward, in a, a chapter in the, a book on the 1970s, turn to examine inflation from the late 60s and give what they call an eclectic explanation. It's a, a mixture of money and non-monetary explanations. Woodward is more of a monetarist in his book with crafts, but in this one he tones it down a bit. Um, what is their argument? What caused an inflation between 1976, sorry, 1967 and 1979? Well, the general argument from economic historians is that there were three peaks in inflation. The first peak, and if you use the RPI on this, inflation rose from 2% in 1967 to about 10% in 71. There's the traditional litany of reasons. I've already outlined some. You know, the, the devaluation, the transmission of US inflation to the rest of the industrialised world. But they do acknowledge that only explains in part the rise of British inflation on that period. They argue instead, as well, that the supply-side disturbances were an influence and cite the wage explosion of 1970-71. And at that point, they argue, the wage bargaining uh, situation was bound to deteriorate because those memories of high unemployment in the interwar years had faded from the labour market and the unions, unions became a lot more bellicose, a lot more aggressive. So the first inflation peak, many historians would argue, can be explained by an upsurge in world inflation coupled to a domestic wage push. Now, in 72 and 73, inflation declined, but from the autumn of 73, it began to rise again. It ran from 15% in 74 and reached that peak of 27% in 1975 on an RPI basis. Now, Schultz and Woodward say, look, it's not just all down to uh, the primary commodity price increase and OPEC-1. There are policy mistakes made during the Heath Barber years, fiscal uh, relaxation in 71, and inflationary expectations were not well anchored as those income policies of the early 70s began to decline. And then for the third, third peak, inflation began to rise from about 1978, I think from the autumn of 78, reaching a peak of 21%, and again on an RPI basis, in 1980. The social contract had broken down, the winter of discontent followed, you have the second oil shock, of course, and then um, you have the increase in indirect taxation in 1979 and a reduction in the standard rate of taxation, which these economic historians argue caused these, uh, this inflation to go up higher by the late 70s, early 80s. Now, for monetary economists, 
this doesn't hold much sway. Accounting for inflation had very little to do with negative supply shocks, OPEC 1 or OPEC 2, or even the sociological explanations, the sort of trade union explanations. Nothing to do with that. McKinnon, back in 1982, and it's difficult, perhaps John can help me later, to find some really good uh, monetary data that's consistent, if it's broad or narrow, for the 1970s internationally. But when McKinnon looked at this in 82, he worked out the world money supply grown rapidly in 71, 72, and again in the late 70s, at between 10 and 13% a year. And many economists at the time began to say, well, look, the problem was an increase in the money supply causes an increase in prices. Now, of course, Friedman had talked about that, as, as Tim said earlier, even from the late, uh, late 40s, early 50s. And Friedman also took aim, and I suppose the same criticism could be levelled at some now, who confused changes in relative prices from changes in absolute prices. The monetarists turned around and said, look, your uh, negative supply side shock, such as OPEC-1, cannot be actually accommodated through an expansionary monetary policy. If it is, inflation takes hold. The best thing to do is sit on your hands. Well, no one sat on their hands over the last two years with the excess growth of broad money, as Tim said earlier. So monetarist writing in the 70s were very dismissive of these sociological explanations. Some of you probably knew George Zeese at Manchester University, uh, who along with a few other colleagues, like David Lather and, and Ward, said that the cause of inflation were not industrial unrest, Industrial unrest was a consequence, not a cause of inflation. There was too much money chasing too few goods, and the unions became more bellicose because of that. And then, if you really want to um, see a more recent analysis, a monetary analysis of it all, I go to Ed Nelson and the work of his, his co-authors, uh, many co-authors over the last 20 years. And in what is termed the monetary policy neglect thesis, he advances the argument that until the late 1970s, UK policymakers failed to actually acknowledge the primacy of monetary policy in controlling inflation. They used all the non-monetary approaches, wages and price controls, for example. That neglect, of course, we've heard it mentioned once already today, was the influence of the Radcliffe Committee in 1959, which reported back to the government at the time, and as Alan Waters once remarked, it was an uncritical acceptance of neo-Keynesianism as a theoretical basis for monetary policy. Ed Nelson doesn't just rely on textual analysis, which is what I do. Through his work, there's a lot of econometric analysis as well. And Forrest Cappy, in his book on the Bank of England, which you're all familiar with, of course, delved into the archives of the bank and concluded as well, at the outset of the period, financial stability was taken for granted. Monetary policy was downplayed in importance. But monetary policy conducted by neglect failed, and financial stability was lost. Now, all pretty clear-cut, and you thought that argument was over. Duncan Needham, though, in 2014, based on his PhD thesis, said, look, policy makers did not neglect the money supply. The monetary policy neglect thesis actually contradicts the public pronouncements made by the most senior bank officials. Any policy mistakes made, and so far there were policy mistakes, occurred because they mis mismeasured the output gap. Now, looking at the archival evidence that I've looked at, I just can't actually link this up to what officials said publicly and what they were saying internally in the Treasury and the bank. But we should, I think, really dismiss the mismeasurement of the output gap as an excuse for poor policy decisions straight away. Several economists, Laidler, Nelson, as remarked, the UK policymakers' framework surrounding inflation analysis and control was fundamentally misconceived when given rise to serious errors, even in conditions of an accurate gap measurement. The output gap was not the big problem. Excess supply of money was. I think the problem is, again, and Tim touched on it earlier, and so did Duan, that often any mention of monetary policy by officialdom is often taken as evidence that they were concerned, the authorities were concerned about money, monetary policy. So the monetary policy neglect thesis falls away. Just because they mention interest rates or monetary policy doesn't mean they actually understood Friedman. And in fact, as I've shown in my work with Gordon Pepper in the noughties, many of these policymakers had limited concern about the money supply and only introduced these measures 
for political economy reasons. I put that quote up there. That comes from um, a witness seminar. Tim, you were at that witness seminar back in 2005 when we put together a, quite a, a, a healthy audience and healthy um, panels looking at the changing climate of opinion between 1974 and 1979. Um, and Brendan Sewell, you can probably all read all that. When he entered the Treasury in 1970, it was 100% Keynesian, and it remained 100% Keynesian. And noting Jeff Littler, who was, of course, at the time, quite senior in the Treasury, I never heard any suggestion that the economic problems could be solved by controlling the money supply. Monetary policy was there to support the budget judgment, the fiscal balance, and it only had a very subsidiary role to play. Now, of course, we could spend all day, all afternoon, talking about the, the problems of the Heath government. But until recently, I think these numbers are quite staggering. Heath, of course, never got to grips with the technicalities of monetary policy. It took the chancellor until October 1970 before he did really want monetary policy at all, um, and the muddle through became very acute. In the two years after October 1971, the broad monetary aggregate, M3, grew by almost 60%, in fact slightly over 60%. Why? Well, that first increase, of course, was caused by the growth in bank lending. Thereafter, it was the debt being sold to the non-bank private sector. In other words, the government was borrowing from the banking system. And then you have the asset price inflation, mainly in residential and commercial property. And of course, as the monetarists argued, with a lag of up to 18 months at the time, a long and variable time lag, inflation peaked at 25% by 1975. Evidence from the archives that was not available when we did the witness seminar in 2005 supports this absolutely. These guys were Keynesians through and through. Now, they were being told by the IMF and others and outside academics that they needed to focus more on the role of the money supply. That really occurred from the late 1960s. When the IMF came into the UK, they were shocked by the monetary ignorance in the Bank of England. I think Charles is not here at the moment, but Charles was one of the few people that actually stood out as understanding monetary policy. Needham explains that the Chancellor signed off an unpublished 20% target for M3 the level which he believed was necessary to finance the 5% GDP growth target of the 72 budget, as an error, not one of omission. I mean, Edward Heath, we know, refused to raise interest rates. Alan Waters resigned on that very point, because Ted Heath refused. Brian Reddy also resigned at the time as well, another ex Lombard Street research employee. Two quotes there, again, one from Christopher Dow from his memoirs, which are a fascinating reading. The bank backed the incomes policy solution as it had under Leslie O'Brien, who was governor in the 60s until Gordon Richardson took over. This was very much my view and was the predominant one in the bank. No monetary economist there. Jeff Littler in the Treasury on Healy. Dennis was intellectually very interested in monetary targets, but it could hardly be said to have constituted a major feature of government's policy. We spent much more time talking about um, pay policy every day than the money supply. And in 2005, at that witness seminar, Gordon and I cornered poor Kit McMahon and said, Kit, what is this about you having to write a, a money supply paper with um, Christopher Dow and John Ford? And we put some arguments to, 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 to Kit McMahon about, you know, um, effectively, was this done with the belief of Friedman, or did you do it for political economy reasons? In other words, trying to placate markets and trying to hit a target that was not really understood. McMahon's reply was unequivocal. My reasons for supporting a publicly announced money supply target in mid-1976 was very much on the lines you set out. Neither Dow, Ford, nor I believed at all in Friedman monetarism. Again, no intention at all of a monetary policy acceptance. Money did not matter. Michael, we've got another part of the slide. Sorry? This next slide. This next one here. Oh, okay. I'm coming on to that. <laughs> right, so, okay. I, in your paper, what that stuff is actually written up. Yeah, yeah, I'm coming on to that. I'm coming on to that. <coughs> I'm coming on to it. Of course, let's move on to it. Douglas Wass. So Douglas Wass was the permanent secretary of the Treasury from about 1976 or so to 1983. And Douglas Wass, effectively, was a Keynesian. He had to, of course, through this period, undergo an enormous amount of stress 
in the 76 sterling crisis and then taking over when Thatcher came to power. He was not a natural monetarist, as many of you know. Here's a quote. The Treasurer of the Bank of England did not accept the precepts of the monetary store at any rate until 79. Bang. The bank governor described himself as a practical monetarist in a lecture in 78. Hardly qualified him as a commitment to an attempt to secure the rigid control of the money supply. Neither the bank nor the Treasury believed that the money supply figures had a determining effect on future inflation. Policy was certainly not framed with a single-minded wish to secure some desired outcome from the monetary variables. Now, all I'll do, because I'm conscious of time, all I'll do is just quote from uh, the first MTFS in 1980, the Thatcher government's first MTFS in 1980 on page 16. To reduce inflation, it will, be, it will progressively reduce the growth of the money stock and it will pursue policies to achieve this aim. Control of the money supply will, over a period of years, reduce the rate of inflation. Now, of course, that's the 1970s, into the 80s. I just want to say a few words about that, if I may, I've got some time. Needham also suggests that by 1981, the monetarist case had been undermined by the findings of a thoroughgoing Treasury study, which concluded that inflation was not simply a monetary phenomenon. This is not accurate. The Treasury Working Group on the Money Supply and Inflation, led by John O'Dea and Smee, concluded, quote, the evidence certainly suggests that money supply plays a significant role in determining prices in the long run. Bang. They were less convinced that an excessive growth of board money led to that price explosion of the early 70s, but noted it does not necessarily imply that the 75 inflation was non-monetary in origin, and pointed out, of course, how the growth of board money had preceded the increase and world export prices in 73, 75. The issue for the Thatcher government, as many of you know, became the one of determining if M3, Sterling M3, was the right, the best aggregate to target, and whether it needed supplementing or replacing with a target for a narrow money aggregate. Undeniably, and Tim, even you, I think, would admit this, in fact, you wrote this in 1981, <coughs> the target for M3 was distorted by the corset, the unwinding of the corset, um, the bill leak, the euro leak, the circumvent corset, all after exchange controls were abolished. <coughs> but the conclusions of these monetary economists, who were shocked with what was going on effectively, and who monitored the situation closely, um, actually pointed to different monetary aggregates and said, look, you've got to look at underlying monetary growth which is very different from just hitting a rigid target. I think if they abandoned Sterling M3 then, it would have led to questions over the credibility of the government's monetary strategy, and it would have been very difficult for ministers to actually make the case for another monetary aggregate at that stage, even if it had been a broader one, such as M4, or uh, 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 there was another one, M5 as well. And in fact, the MTFS had actually said the way in which the money supply is defined for target purposes may need to be adjusted from time to time as circumstances change. It was all there back in the first place. So some conclusions. You have the conclusions there by Sir Douglas Watts. Um, effectively, all I would say is where it has failed over the last 30, 40 years, monetarism has not failed. If failure is awarded on the basis that the government missed some of its targets for the money supply, so what? But look how inflation came down, and the widespread acceptance since 79 that you controlled inflation not by administrative industrial tax measures, but by other means, money matters. But they have failed since the early 1970s by paying insufficient attention to bank lending to the private sector. It's not a criticism that they failed to forecast bank lending. You try and do that. Very difficult to do. It's notoriously difficult. The criticism is this. They failed to realise the significance of what was happening when it became known that the bank lending was too buoyant or too sluggish. Because the enemy of inflation, of course, is deflation. So to the economists out there today who actually feel the arguments over monetarism and debt management policy should only concern people like me in economic history or financial history. Many of those lessons post-75 have yet to be drawn by policymakers, as we've heard today. And I think they're especially pertinent for central banks and monetary economists in the 2020s.